Atheist Nomads episode 111, Black Non-Believers with Alex Jules. Please note that there is exclusive patron-only content after the outro. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 26, 27, 40. (laughs) We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode 111. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there, how's it going? And joining us today is Alex Jules. Alex is a black atheist surviving life in Texas, president of the Black Nonbelievers of Dallas, on the board with Secular Avenue, has been featured in Ebony Magazine, as well as many other fine news outlets around the world. He blogs at Graffiti Wall on Patheos and is the funny guy on Dogma Debate. Alex, welcome to Atheist Nomads. <laughs> Uh, if David, uh, if David Smalley hears this, he's going to kill me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> Funny guy. Yes. Don't, thank don't you worry. Nobody me. listens yeah. to us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Alex, uh, let, let's, let's start with your, your, your background, because I know you've got mm-hmm. a, a very, had a fascinating upbringing that, well, okay. Just to put it bluntly due to horrible oversights in our, our, uh, scheduling guest scheduling yeah the two black people we've had on the show before were both raised jehovah's witness and you've got a bit different perspective um so what was it like growing up um i i grew up in a household and it was a little different for me i grew up uh in new york where uh in an afro-caribbean neighborhood i'm i'm haitian and, um, you know, grew up with Jamaicans, et cetera. I grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up uh, Roman Catholic. Right. But it was a very different kind of Roman Catholic. I, I, I don't know if a whole lot of people would really recognize this, this version of Roman Catholicism. Uh, <laughs> why, do I, why do I think Santeria is going to be involved? <laughs> uh, I, I, unfortunately, yeah, there, there was there was a lot of uh, voodoo that was associated yeah. with it. Right. I mean, it, it, it was it's culturally it was partly. Yeah, uh, what kept me in the the church? Quite honestly, I was fascinated with the occult side. I, you know, you had the light side, you had the dark side, and and the occult was absolutely fascinating. In fact, it was really cool. I know the Catholic Church or the Brooklyn Archdiocese would deny it now, but I swear I must have been maybe six, seven years old, and there was a woman that came in that was possessed by voodoo demons, and she started you know spitting and screaming and and, and what have you. And uh, and and a Catholic priest, not a deacon, but an actual Catholic priest came out and he was screaming at her. And and I swear I I I witnessed what was, you know, looked like it looked like an exorcism to me again, you know, because of the way those things are sanctioned. Um, I'm sure they deny it now. But as a child, can you imagine what that did to me? Oh, my goodness. I, I was sold. I was like. Man, this is some interesting stuff. I just saw my first <laughs> taste of real evidence. You know, I was I was literally waiting for her to start throwing up pea soup, and her head stop <laughs> heads and start spinning. I was like, I this this is this is my life, and uh, that actually was one of the reasons why I really wanted to be a priest. Right? I, I mean, that's mm. that was that was something that was heavily ingrained in me as a child. Right? This idea of service to the community. Of course, it was an economically um, uh, disadvantaged or uh, depreciated community. Brooklyn, New York, it's 
I think 50% of the actual neighborhood that I, w- I grew up in had about a 50% literacy rate um, wow. by the time. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely horrific. I mean, you, you almost don't want to admit that this is an American city or American neighborhood. But, um, you know, so there was death. There was, um, uh, there, there was all kinds of despair. And we had uh, basically church missionaries that were out there, priests and, and people that were doing good out in the communities and making people feel better. So that drew me in. Now, my, my mother didn't like a lot of the Catholic churches or the Catholic schools that were out there. She didn't think that they were, she didn't think they were rigid enough. I right. guess. I, <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. and, and it's funny, it's funny because I look at a lot of my, my now atheist friends, it's like, you were Catholic too? Like, oh yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, yeah, they, they really do breed a lot of atheists. But um, <laughs> they, they really do. Uh, so she decided that she was going to put me in a Seventh-day Adventist school. So SDA um, school, which was bilingual. It was French and it was English. And uh, that that was as, as early as I can remember. Um, I did pre-kindergarten there. I actually still remember some of these stories from, from pre-kindergarten. Uh, I remember my kindergarten teacher you know, and and having that Bible in the front of the class and people, you know, coming in to read the Bible. I remember one of the challenges that we had is every year we were learning, I want to say it was about 100 different verses, and it had to be part of rote memory. So this was something that my mother thought was was great. Unfortunately, as we were talking earlier, there was a lot of corporal punishment that was involved as well, and everyone signed off on it, and parents signed off on it because it was, it was culturally acceptable at the time. Um, and, and so if you didn't get it, well, you got it, if you know what I'm saying. So there was a lot of, um, as if religion doesn't have enough fear and, and carried in the stick already, here you go, you have the physical manifestation of an all loving punishing deity um, wrapped up in a five foot eight woman who, you know, is just the nicest, sweetest woman until you piss her off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> you know. so this was at an Adventist school in New York? In New York, yeah. It, it is still mm. open. It is still open. I looked it up. It is still open. It's, uh, it's in Brooklyn, not too far off of Ocean Avenue. Um, and, and Nostrand, you know, still, still very much, um, uh, I, I want to say steeped in the old tradition and old ways, but yeah, it's, well, it's still there. That was one thing I, I, I definitely noticed in, uh, my time in the Adventist church was now I was in the, the Northwest grew up with that and thought, okay, this is a, a pretty liberal or at least moderate church. Then I went to the seminary at Andrews and got to, well, I, I was a minority at the seminary. Uh, hmm. Blacks, pr- uh, primarily of uh, Caribbean descent, were probably the largest group there. Yeah. Wow. And then I found out about how incredibly segregated the Adventist church is. Now, there's really two churches, the white church and the black church. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like the Baptist. If it's not on the West Coast, it's really freaking conservative. Yeah. And so do you know whether... Whether the uh, that school you're attending was through the local conference or the region, I believe it was the local conference. Um, because the but, well, conference is the the white church, the region is the the black church. Then it, you know what I, I had until I left New York, I had not met um, one one white Adventist. <laughs> How's that one for you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, they actually it? just came out with, uh, there was a, a survey on, on diversity in across religious groups. Adventists actually came out as the most diverse. Yeah. Pretty evenly split, black, white, and Hispanic. Might be diverse, but you're saying that it's very segregated. Segregated. Still. It's very yeah, segregated. segregated. Yeah. And it's, right it's now, Hispanics are actually losing out the most with the segregation. Because they don't really fit in either the white church or the black church. Yeah. And they don't have the same privileges because with the, the segregation, you at least know that the leaders overseeing your church, the, uh, you know, the conference officials are going to like church similar to the way you do. 
Do you think that's something to do with the language barriers between the SGA churches in like Latin America, like you went to Dustin and the, the churches here in America? No, no, okay. no uh, Latin America is <laughs> that's totally separate, completely it's, separate. All right. Yeah. But man, that's a, a definitely a, a different experience than I had with, uh, yeah. with Adventist schools. Yeah. So how long did you attend that school? Um, I attended that school. Um, I mean, it was the first school that I attended uh, all the way into, I think it was the fourth grade. Um, and my, my, my mother was um, very interested uh, in making sure that my math and science, interestingly enough, uh, was, was cared for. And when you take a look at, at least back then, you know, I, I don't want to say back then it was all about creationism and, mm -hmm. you know, it's been, it's been a long time. So there's, you know, I know some churches have loosened up when it comes to, they're a little bit more tolerant when it comes to, to the idea of evolution, although they may not uh, accept it or they'll say, yeah, we accept it, but the first cause is God, et cetera, blah, blah. And, um, you know, m my mother was really interested in, because I, I had an affinity for math. And sciences, uh, and and so in the fifth grade, she decides that you know she's she's going to find a school that um, is still religious, you know, good private parochial school, still a very strong biblical sense associated with the teaching, but will also provide me with the ability to excel in math and science, and so she decided to put me in a Lutheran school. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know what? How can you? How could I not be an atheist? You know, by now. I mean, I've, wow. I've been exposed to them all, uh, and 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 every Sunday, and uh, every, I was in church. I, you know, I prayed more than Muslims at one point. Um, <laughs> it, it really, it really was. You wake up, you pray. You know, every time you eat, you pray. You, know, you go to bed, you pray. And I was like, wait, this is more than five times a day. I'm getting the short end of the stick here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so I, I went to it was St. Mark's Lutheran School, also in Brooklyn, and it was predominantly a, a black school, black Lutheran school, but the church was predominantly white. But the school was black. The church was white. Um, oh. And yeah, yeah, that 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 was interesting. And then the pastor and and his wife were also very white. Um they, they were traditional Southern Christians that had moved to New York for work. And, um, you know, the um, I, I remember Miss Nordeen, she, uh, was, she was my seventh grade teacher. Man, she was a hard ass, too. Um, <laughs> she really, really was. Uh, and, and she said she wanted to be a nun all growing up. I was like, oh, well, that explains a whole lot, nun. Um, and uh, she, she really was the gatekeeper in the school itself, and, and she set the tempo uh, and the tenor for for the school, and it was set very rigor rigorously. Rigorously, uh, we had a principal by the name of of Mr. Goldberg, just a, a phenomenal individual who happened to be African American, was very much tied to the civil rights movement, at least in the North, and he 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 was very pro. Know yourself, understand the struggle, uh, understand that you are more than us. Like I, I swore that you know every time that 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 he spoke, you know Jesse Jackson grew wings or something. I was like, come on, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but but he would really engender that 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 sense of of pride and accomplishment when he spoke to uh, spoke to us and with a lot of the uh, black young men that we had. Where we didn't have a multicultural um, curriculum in New York City per se, he made sure that aspects of multiculturalism were were in our hands, right? So always we're we're going to be talking about history. We're going to be talking about all of everyone's contributions, not to just American history, but African history, European history, et cetera. The the story of Hannibal. I think the the very first time I heard that. Um, wasn't in high school. It was actually in in this school. We got to talk about it, et cetera. Mm. When when we talked about civil rights as not just an era but a continuing movement, things like that were mm -hmm. were were very instrumental in making sure that I had the kind of confidence 
that I would need when dealing with some of the struggles that I knew that I would, would face uh, in, in the future. I mean, you need a little bit of that swag or you need a little bit of that confidence. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to believe you. Those kinds of things that help, you know, get me through uh, the, uh, the remaining 20 some odd years that, that, that it's been since I've left the school. And um, it really very much taught me not to be afraid of intelligence and don't be afraid of my intelligence. Don't be afraid to challenge anyone. Um, and that's I, <laughs> it, it's funny because we still had this biblical um, grounding. And when it came to the civil rights movement or the civil rights era, there's no way that you can get away from the idea of God. I mean, you just, you just, you just can't, mm-hmm. right? Even yeah. though it takes a significant amount of dissonance to, to say, I mean, is this the same God that allowed everything else to happen pre-civil rights that we are now thanking for letting us be free of those things that he didn't seem to give a shit about? before i mean is that is you know um it, it's, it's, who, it's one of those <laughs> yeah the god who the best he could say on slavery yeah. was don't beat your slave to death right yeah here's the size of stick you can use right right hmm. uh and and so I, I i went from there into um you know math and science were very very interesting to me and um i went to school wanting to study math and science i actually went to a public school a magnet school in new york uh, you know, it's called the Bronx High School of Science. And uh, it was the really the first time that I, I got to meet people of other religions, you know, outside of these, uh, outside of Christendom, you know, the first real Muslim. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, the, the, the five percenters or the nation of Islam. I'm talking about seeing turbans, seeing the hijab, uh, hijab seeing women that, that, that had the blue eyes and wearing that. That was very different to me, you know, being exposed to atheists and agnostics. And honestly, it, I could not compute the idea of there being someone who didn't believe in some type of God. It, it just did not make sense to me. It was completely foreign. Mm-hmm. You, you got to believe in something. I believe in myself. Well, well, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> oh, it's, I, it's, it's a little different now. I totally, right? <laughs> I totally remember that. Uh, thinking, and just like what, what you said, Wesley, believing that atheists just worship themselves, made themselves God. Uh, oh, no, I don't even go that far. I know I'm a dick. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it was, um, you know, I, I, the confidence of not being or, or not having to back down. Um, I don't remember the first time someone gave me the um, the proverbial bloody nose on my belief. I think it was the pro was probably freshman year when um, when, when we're, we're outside and we're talking about um, about my religious beliefs, because you know what? Why not? And um, I'm ready to defend them. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go at it. I actually still had a Bible in my bag, a little small one in my bag. I carried it. And so it wasn't, um, one of my friends referred to me at, at the time as like, look, it's the rogue altar boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that name stuck for a little bit. <laughs> about how uh, old like, were you at the time? I, I was, I want to say it was about, about 14 years old, 13, 14 years old when okay. I was, I was taking on seniors and ready to quote Bible and, and verse. And I mean, I'm talking to, you know, kids with, with IQs that are ridiculous and, and they're completely steeped in the idea of debate and they've seen the world. And I am now leaving my segregated. And it was, I mean, still, this was, this was 19, this was 19, late eighties, early nineties. But, you know, reality is we still live in a very, very segregated country Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not legally segregated, but, you know, not everyone has the ability to go up and down the social ladder and move out of their, um, their assigned slots. Uh, and by, by your mom pulling you out of the public school system, that also kept you into segregated environments. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. then my, my belief, you know, my belief system was completely crafted for me. It, it, I was literally spoon fed. When I had doubts, when I had questions, um, when I went to, uh, 
to the leaders in the SDA, church, there were there were no questions, right? There, there were no questions. There was just fear. Uh, when I went to uh, my pastor in uh, in the Lutheran church, uh, his response to me was, "Well, you know, we all deal with with doubt, and you'll find your way." And then when I would deal with my own personal priest, you know, I, I would have these questions for him. Uh, we, it, I, I go back as far as Genesis and, and literal creationism, and I would say, hey, I'm having issues with Genesis and Exodus. I'm having issues here. And his re- response was, well, nobody actually believes that. Ah. I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once right? you start picking and choosing. Yeah. Right. Right. That's yeah. a right. bad road to go down. Yeah. Well, the Catholic Church, though, has it easy with that because they have tradition and dogma, not doctrine and what the rest of Christianity has. And yeah. so it's all very fluid and tradition and dogma outrank the Bible. Yeah. That's, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. That's also how they're so successful holding people in areas like Latin America and Haiti. That's why there was so much of that uh, voodoo uh, being pulled into uh, Catholicism. Yeah. It's a, it's a fluid tradition. Yes. Yes. Highly adaptable. Uh, and, and, uh, and it shows that I had I had friends who, you know, Santeria was was nothing that was un, uncommon at all in my neighborhood. Uh, voodoo itself was was something that was not uncommon at all. But we call ourselves Catholic, right? Because um, mm-hmm. it because it fit. It's fit. Let's stop for a quick break, and then uh, we'll we'll pick up right back there. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. After getting getting my ass handed to me you know, several times in, um, in high school on, on belief, yeah. And having my confidence kind of shaken, I actually started to engage people in actual dialogue. So it wasn't me trying to defend myself or, or, or my belief, me trying to gang up on them and convince them that they're wrong. I really tried to understand their, their beliefs. I didn't realize that in doing so, that I would gain tremendous tolerance and understanding and uh, and empathy, but it was really what what helped undo a lot of my my own personal faith. Um, I think it was really about junior year or so that I had had my my first real crisis of of faith in Catholicism, and I was having real problems with um, uh, uh, not just the cat. I mean, I was already a confirmed Catholic. Did I really believe what? I thought I believed. Um, I, I was having serious, serious issues, stuff that kept me up all night. And in, in trying to find a lot of those answers, I, um, I, I actually spent time with some of my Muslim friends. And uh, I, I don't know how, how it happened, but I actually converted to Islam for a while. <laughs> for Whoa, a while. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. I'm telling you, I went the whole gamut. And <laughs> um, I don't know. Did you ever get? Were you ever a Jew? No, I never did that. So ah. no, 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 I, I did not do that. The chosen um, people. Yeah, I, a, a few, a few friends have told me, you know, there's still time. I was like, well, you know what? Ah. No, it's uh, no, I'm good. And <laughs> wow, so now you're getting indoctrinated into your fourth, very distinctive yes. tradition. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. But it's but it's a continuation, and when you take a look at Jew. Judaism, and if you take just a macro view of it, and you uh, make sure that uh, the conflicts kind of don't overlap all that much, um, it started. The story started in Judaism. It continued in Christianity. And if you spend a little bit of time listening to what Muslims say, it's really just a a continuation, continuation. Yeah. of of tradition. So for me, it was where Christianity was missing. Uh, I, you know, I was able to pick up a lot of that in Islam. And so for about a year, year and a half, 
you know, that was what I was studying. Um, I, I had actually moved in um, for several months with a, a my mom was not very happy with this idea, but I had moved in with uh, with a Muslim family that was helping me through. And I, I had actually started learning, um, you know, how to read the uh, the Quran and the Hadith and and really try and wrap my head around it. And, you know, I was praying less as a Muslim than I was as a Catholic. Um, so, <laughs> nice. How did that happen? I was like, hey, that, that, that's good. It's a, it's a break, you know. Um, but I, I think there was a strong pull back to tradition for me. I felt as if I had violated a, 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 an understanding that I had with my family, right? Because we'd always been Catholic or we, we'd always been Christian. And so although I dabbled in Islam and I was really trying to find my way through Islam and my family was tolerant of me exploring um, other beliefs because I, as long as I believed in our, our God, the same God, didn't matter <clears throat> what vantage I took, as long as I believed in that God, I was good. I was, I was always going to be saved, right? Um, and so we walked, you know, I walked that journey. And um, I, I got to a precipice, and I want to say it was about senior year, where, um, where the, the answers weren't good enough, right? And I looked back, and I spent time really reflecting, I, and I became a little bit more introverted. I, I, um, I don't want to say that I was dealing with, with you know, mild depression, but I was very, very lost um, because I, I, I really had challenged everything that I had, and I was like, okay. What do I call myself now, right? Because I'm not sure I believe. And um, based on you know more conversations with with my pastor, with my minister, with the priest, it, it, the the answer was really clear to me that I, I just had not thrown myself um, into my studies, my religious studies, uh, hard enough. I, there wasn't enough rigor. And so, you know, right. for, yeah, first, first year <laughs> after that, you know, what do you do? Join seminary. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So Catholic seminary, Catholic seminary, Saint, yeah. St. Matt, um, <laughs> actually it was St. John's, excuse me, went to, went to church at St. Matt. Um, and, and, and I, I, I was going, I was going to be all in it. It, it only lasted a few months and it, I was done. Um, and and it, was, it was really very simple for me because when we started approaching the Bible as is um, and we started to look at it differently, and I didn't realize at the time that when you're really studying the Bible in a way that allows you to teach it, because eventually that's what priests do, they will uh, console and give continence you know, via the Bible, they, they have to be able to teach it. You approach the Bible a little bit differently. And when you're doing that, I, I kind of wanted to understand more of how the Bible was made, how it was, how it was written, more of the history behind the Bible and not just the book itself, but what were the motivations behind it? What, 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 what fell out of the Bible? What, made it into canon and why. And, and I started studying a little bit of that and man, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was it. I, I, I was done. And it was kind of funny because almost 50% of my class was like, yeah, we're not going to do this either. I'm like, oh, okay. So I, <laughs> I <laughs> you know, the, the part that made it in is interesting, but the part that got left out is so much more interesting to me. Yeah. yeah oh, yes, man. it is. When I was yes, in it is. My, my seminary education, I got to do a class. Uh, I, I scored high enough on Greek that I got to do the new Testament honors track. And so it was all electives. I did a seminar on Gnosticism where oh, man. we were reading yeah. the actual Nagamati Gospels. Yeah. Shit. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how old yeah. were you at this point? Um, I was in college uh, at the time. So I'm, I'm, I am, what, 19 years old? 19. And um, that that's almost where my, my button got 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 pushed or got paused right so uh, on my religious um i wouldn't call myself an atheist i called myself um spiritual but not oh, religious no. oh uh, yeah i i was that <laughs> guy i was that guy no. you know 
Oh, did, oh man. did you hit like, new age? No, no, I, no, I never hit. No, I didn't do do new age because that might have been too close to, you know, funky, weird woo stuff for me. Or, you know, and at the time, of course, not really understanding um, Satanism and and and, uh, you know, potential devil worship. I didn't realize what my beliefs really were. I didn't want to face what those beliefs really were either, right? Because mm. I knew one thing. I didn't believe in any of this anymore. I, I didn't want to know what I I was. I didn't want to call myself the A word because <laughs> that that wasn't there. There's no way that that was going to fly. Mm-hmm. Not in my, my community, not in my church. I still went to church. I went with my family. I went with... You know, I wound up getting married a few few years later, and and you know, it, it's it's just something that you did. You know, it was part of the culture, and in the Afro Caribbean and African American communities, you need that, right? Because um, where are you going to get the good men? Where are you going to get you know um, get uh, all these social the social uh, benefits? Uh, that that the community offers. Well, I mean, you walk into the door in church, and hey, it's it's right there. Uh, and 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 of course, uh, you know, it, it's it's almost a self fulfilling prophecy, right? Because um, the the church tells you how bad you are, but when you want to feel good, you go to the same place. So it's a one stop shop for everything. And if they're the ones mm-hmm. that meet all your needs, exactly. Even though that they're the ones that are making you, you know, feel ill in the first place, it doesn't matter, right? You're, you're going to keep keep going. It's 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 a really bad case of spiritual heroin, and uh, I, I I I kind of walked away, but I had one foot in the door. My uh, my wife at the time was very very uh, still very very religious, and I had uh, my my first two children, and um, I have too many now. Uh, I just, I, I tell, I tell, I tell people how many kids I want. It's like, what? You're, you're black Mormons? Like, no, I'm cursed, <laughs> son of him. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I'm not a Mormon. Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, <laughs> I, I kept going to church, and I kept taking the kids to church. They were in it, and they were going through the motions. I don't know whether. My son was just picking up on the ideas that, you know, dad is just here to be here and, and what have you. And uh, uh, my wife at the time knew that, you know, I, 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 w- I was done with church. I, it was a chore at that time. But again, when it came to the connections with community and the connections with um uh, with job opportunities, networking, et cetera, it was the church. Now, at this time, I had relocated from New York to Texas. And of course, being in Texas, uh, you know, this was several years ago, almost what, 18 years ago. Uh, it hasn't been that long. It, it's really hard to be socially mobile and not rely on the church, right? Especially when you're new. You, you need something that's going to grind that's going to ground you in uh, into the community and why not a church right mm-hmm. um you know right now we've got meet up and all that other fun jazz but that didn't exist back then so default was the church and so 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 i did the church and kept doing the church mm. and um let's see it wasn't again spiritual but not religious and and that was okay with with my family um, but not really my mom, my, my, my mother was, was not okay with me being, you know, she knew that I was, I was just doing the thing where I just showed up and, and cause I stopped doing communion, right? If you don't believe it, I mean, why would I do that? I stopped doing communion. Uh, well, and, and that, especially Catholic that, that mass. was okay. Yeah. Catholic yeah. mass, they tell you it's a curse. Yeah. So it, it's really hard for a parent, and I can say that as a parent, if you believe that your child is going to hell, a place of eternal damnation, or that you're going to heaven and you're never going to see this child again, and you spent um, the majority of your life raising and caring for this child uh, just for this child to be discarded in God's eyes, I mean, that's that's got to hurt. Not only that, you absolutely feel uh, as if you're a failure, you have let this child down, you've let God down. And that's one of the things that I, I don't like about religion because of what it does 
to people's relationships with with their family. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I didn't I didn't use the A word. Um, and then it was September 13th, uh, two days after September 11th is I think I actually used the word September 12th. Um, I got a call on the 11th. And um, there was a friend of mine that 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 calls. Like, hey, did you happen to see what 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 just happened? And I was like, what, what are you talking about? It was late night before, and um, grabbed my phone. And now now I'm watching the first tower, and then I'm watching the second tower. We know the events um, that occurred. Of course, me being a New Yorker with still deep roots in in New York, friends, family, etc. Um, I, I I was. Uh, heavily, con I was very, very concerned about what could potentially happen. The the um, uh, the towers fell. Communications was, you know, kind of went to hell really quick. And um, I, I went through a period of not being able to communicate with family and friends and find friends. And so I was actually on one of the first flights that was allowed into LaGuardia, um, you know, after September 11th. And boy, was it a talk about security. But <laughs> it wasn't too long after that um, where I did begin to verbalize exactly where I was when people would ask me. And and, and I think I've, I've told the story before several years ago that um, it had it been 20 years earlier, I would have been really struggling, you know, trying to find a way to make these people on the street feel better, right, about what happened, right, where where my drive to become a priest, you know, and and make and alleviate people's suffering and pain, I would have would have run to the people that were crying in the street and saying it's it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Well, when I worked when I walked down Church in Vesey, and I was I I got off the train really very early. Um, because I was like, look, I, I'm going to make it down to the square. I'm going to make it down to the hospital. I'm going to go see, um, if any of the pictures have been posted yet. Um, I've, I've got to do this myself. So I, I got off the train really, really early and said, okay, I'm just going to walk, uh, the rest of the way because I've got to psychologically prepare myself for this, which you can't by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm walking through, you know, downtown Manhattan, lower Manhattan, and um, and I'm seeing these people and, and, and the upset and the anger and the despair. And really, the first thing that came to my mind was, I don't have to excuse a God that allowed that to happen because I don't believe in it. So I no longer have to defend. And that's that's one of the things that I would have had to do as a priest. I would have had to defend. Look into some of these families' eyes and say, I let this happen. Your God let this happen, but it's going to be okay. And mm -hmm. all the suffering that you're going to deal with from now until you find them or you never find them, that's okay because there's payback. Okay. Right. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and the thing is I went through, I went through, um, learning what Islam was. So I understood some of the motives behind, uh, what those Muslims did. I kind of get it. Right. There's no justification for it. You got to be kind of sick and twisted to want to do that. But if you understand culturally why they wanted to do it, some of the religious importance of why they wanted to do, do to do that. You, and you understand that it's the same God. How can it be the same God? How can you pledge fealty to a God that would allow that? Whether you're Christian and say there's a reason, there's a cause or whether you're Muslim and say you have a God that condones it, it's, I, I didn't have to fight that. I didn't have to play that game. I didn't have to go through that level of dissonance, that level of torture that I would have had to deal with had I been a priest at that time. And so at, it was right then and there that I realized how truly freeing um, being able to say, hey, I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in this. Let let's let's talk about your real suffering. Let's let's. Mm. What do you need from me now? Yeah, you need and 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 it was and and for for one person it was just just stand with me, like okay, 
And and yeah, I, f- I found people that that would say, "Will you pray with me?" It's like I won't pray with you, but I'll be here right here while you do, and I'll be listening. And for them, that was enough. Again, I didn't have to be the deity or the god to answer those prayers, nor did I have to be one of his henchmen. So that's that's when I used the word atheist, and I've used it every day since, and I've never shied away from it. It's so freeing, you know, just no baggage. Just I love it. All right, it's time for uh, uh, another break, and then uh, we'll be back with. Uh little bit more current stuff yeah if you like this show consider giving us some financial support to make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using paypal or patreon find out more at atheistnomads.com use the links on the right side of the page one dollar an episode is all we ask please think of the kittens all right, we've gotten through to you actually using the the A word now. Uh, <gasps> a mature adult, um, at least into this millennium. Yep. And so, how did you go from from there, finally admitting yourself you're an atheist, to being such a heavily involved activist? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, being a parent had had a um, had a very big. Uh, influence in my level of visibility um, and activism in the atheist community. Uh, I had really, you know, w- with with my family, with my mom and um, uh, and family back east, you know, the word was out. Alex is an atheist, and nope, he's going to keep using it. And that had created a wall between you know New York and the, as if the thirteen hundred mile mile uh, distance wasn't enough. I created a wall. <laughs> uh, don't tell Perry that. He would love that. He's just going to use that. Or even Trump. Like a 1,300-mile wall between... Yeah, no. I, between New York and Texas, not Texas and Mexico, idiot. Um, so, <laughs> hey, don't don't leave out Canada. He's not. Oh, that's true. That's true. That, that's true. Oh, man. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, my, my mother had gotten to the point where <clears throat> we just weren't talking. It, it was done. I, I was for for... For almost a decade, I was dead to her, you know, and yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And um, that meant that I needed to rally my family. I mean, she didn't she wasn't talking to my kids either. Right. It's Uh it's I was I I was leading them into the gates of hell personally. Right. And, um, you know, being able to say that, hey, I'm an atheist and. And my kids were saying, "Hey, yeah, we're we're pretty sure we don't believe in any of that stuff too." And I didn't want I didn't want them to use the the term atheism until they really understood what it meant, uh, especially because of of the connotation that it had in the African American community or in the community at large. And um, I had remarried at the time, and uh, my uh, my wife was was very much you know, "Hey, wouldn't it be great?" If there was something that was like church without God, I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I doubt it exists. Now, this is before Sunday assembly and, or it, it, anything like that. And we found a very small group um, in Dallas. It was called the North Texas Church of Free Thought. And, and we, we, yeah, yeah, it was, it, yeah. And we started attending and it was kind of cool. It was very, very small. Um, and a few of the, families there wanting to uh, focus more on family building and, and what have you and, and uh, focus on, on the kids and what we could provide the kids. So several of us, about 20 of us, broke off and, and created another sect, right? So it was, yes, a, a, re- a re- reformation, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we started what is the Fellowship of Free Thought, which is the largest now, the largest uh, free thinking group in, um, I actually think it's in, in, in Texas at this point, it might be the humanist of, of Houston, might be really close. But we started that and, and the focus was on, on you know, a little bit of diversity and making sure that was very, it was very open and, and, and what have you. And we were interested in bringing Camp Quest to Texas. 
uh, which was kind of crazy at the time. Like, could you really bring a secular camp to Texas? Um, my kids absolutely wanted to do it. Um, they said, you, you, if you get it here, we will attend. And we got it here. And the first year that they were there, you know, both my kids were there and they had a phenomenal time. And it was news, right? Because this was new. It was very, very different. Secular kids, Texas, you got to be kidding me. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> right? Right? Because, because what does that mean to the churches? They're coming for your kids, right? Hell That's exactly yeah. what it means. They're coming for your kids. Um, uh, and and my, my, my son did an interview. Um, I was like, you sure? Because this, this could potentially, you know, be an issue for you later on. Uh, and he's like, no, I, I want to do this. Right. I mean, you, I, I had already put, begun putting myself out there a little bit and, and, and I was becoming more vocal and he said, Hey, I, I want to do this. And, and he did, and he, he did a video and we didn't hear anything about it for several, several, several months. And so we thought, Hey, it was fine. And it, was about Christmas or so. He was in in uh, in public high school at the time in in you know the North Dallas area, and um, uh, a couple of kids cornered him, and um, you know threw him up against the corner. And, you know, shook him down. Uh, he did get hit, and he and he said what what they told him was like, hey, we saw you on the news. We saw a clip of of you on the news in your interview. So so. Explain to me exactly how you can be black and be an atheist. I mean, you got to believe in Jesus. And so they roughed him up a little bit. The school did take disciplinary actions and, and what have you. So I didn't have any real issues with the school or the administration at the time. But what stuck with me, at, you know, and, and it really bothered me, it kept me up at night, was this assertion that you can't be black and be an atheist, though it, it's incoherent, right? It's incompatible. Um, it's and, rare, but it's not. It's, it's rare, but it happens. I mean, what happened before Christianity? Well, you, you had a lot of, you know, very different beliefs and believers, and you had non-believers too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're, they've always been there. And uh, I decided that I was going to become much more active, much more vocal in um in talking to the African-American community and to the Afro-Caribbean community about agnosticism and free thought and atheism. And uh, it just so happened that um, I, I had a friend uh, at American Atheist um, who introduced me to a couple of reporters and said, hey, uh, let me help you get this story out. It's not something that we're talking about. One thing led to another, a couple of news articles uh, get released, my name <laughs> attached to it. And then Ebony Magazine comes um, comes knocking on my door and says, hey, we'd like to feature you in Ebony Magazine, which at the time was, again, completely unheard of because this was the very first time that they broached the idea of atheism at all uh, in a subscription of over a million plus. And so did an interview, had this great conversation with them, and uh, uh, that really set off just several, several um, massive domino effect in, in putting my name out there and having conversations. And almost everything happened afterwards, right? Um, and you got an awesome billboard with you in Langston. Yeah, that 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 one that that one actually came. Uh, I want to say about two, a year, almost two years later, where again this the Ebony Magazine piece really did. Um, help get my my particular story out there. The NPR story was I thought was probably the best one. Uh, but when when um, uh, CFI decided that they were going to do uh, this is the Center for Inquiry, the Council for Secular Humanism has the AAH, the African American for Humanism Initiative, which focuses on bridging the gap between the African American communities and minority communities and free thought. Um, you know, Todd Stiefel, you know, really helped bankroll that. And I mean, he was awesome. And I'm going to be forever grateful uh, to him for that. But Debbie Goddard really helped uh, help pull that all together. And we it was about 11 or 12 cities. And it was truly a national campaign. 
And I got paired up with Langston Hughes, which was funny because uh, it was some of his readings as I was leaving religion that helped me come to terms and come to grips with what I might be, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Goodbye Christ, goodbye Christ. I I almost recommend goodbye Christ to anyone who who is black and really doesn't think that, you know, you, you might you might have doubts. Well, go read, read Goodbye Christ, and 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 you might see um, how historically we've always had questions and concerns about Christianity, religion, and and Christendom. So I got paired up with Langston Hughes, and um, of course, being in Texas, in the heart of the South, in I mean, truly deep Bible Belt this exploded, right? There were 11 other uh, billboards out there, but the one in Dallas absolutely exploded, right? And it just happened to be just a couple of miles away from T.D. Jake's church. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> accidentally, completely accidentally that, you know, it, 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 but it was really good position. And, um, you know, a lot of ministers were really upset, but it started tremendous dialogue. People were reaching out to me from across the globe. Hey, where where can I find um, groups like yours? You know, I'm in New York and I don't know. I'm in Atlanta and I don't know. I'm in L.A. and I don't know. And so it, it was great. And so we have seen a tremendous amount of groundswell um, from that campaign that has just rippled um, across, you know, just year after year. You know, two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes, you know, exponentially larger. Um, and and believe it or not, I was I didn't really want to bring um, black nonbelievers to to Dallas uh, simply because I was afraid of the potential marginalization that would happen. Like, oh, look, there's only five of them. But <laughs> 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 um, but 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 I did change my mind a little bit because. Um, there was there was such a demand. There 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 were people that was like, hey, we want to meet, we want to do this, and if we don't meet, let's at least connect. And and online, there's a thriving African American community of non-believers and the and and agnostics and and atheists and including the anti-theist as well. There's a lot of those, um, but it's just been like I said, a tremendous groundswell, uh, which has allowed me to get involved in a lot of other. Um, in, in a lot of uh, other projects. And again, you know, Mandisa Thomas has been just absolutely amazing with taking the message of Black non-believers from just Black non-believers Atlanta into a, um, oh, I want to say that we're either at 10 or 11 cities right now and we're growing, you know, D.C., Detroit, Dallas, um, um, Atlanta proper. I mean, it, so there's Chicago. There, there's a lot of momentum and still demand for we need those groups. And unfortunately, you still do need those groups. I'd love to be able to say that, you know, uh, black non-believers or, or people of color um, were comfortable in just walking into a humanist group. Um, but it's not always the most welcoming. And there are there are issues that always come up that uh, that makes it really difficult to bridge. So we still mm-hmm. need those safe spaces until we can either grow to a point, a tipping point where we see massive crossover into a lot of the humanist groups. And I actually see that in Dallas. Uh, you know, many of the, you know, black non-believe believers uh, in Dallas, they, they you know, have no issues whatsoever crossing over into, um, uh, into the general assembly of or the big tent atheist groups. But um, there's still this, can we still have our own safe space where we can have, uh, I don't want to say come to Jesus meetings, but, uh, but, yeah. but, but meetings where we can really talk and, and let our guards completely down and talk dirty and talk dirt. Do you think it's the fact that there is a specifically black group that's making it easier for black atheists to get involved with the broader community? Or is it just yes. that there's enough out there black atheists that there is a, a critical mass? So I, I think I think the groups enable critical mass, right? So you have, you know, think of it as as just one magnet. And you have and, and they're little poles, right? You have just little magnets here and there. And they they wind up pulling 
um, the groups. You know, I have people that will drive 30, 40, 50 miles, you know, uh, occasionally to, to, to come do an event. Um, and then, you know, same thing I, I hear from other BN, uh, BN organizations and other black non-believers groups. So there is enough critical mass in those groups where they feel safe enough that, hey, I still have this and I can keep my one foot in. Um, and then I can spill over into the broader atheist community. Now, I will say that quite often it is a very toxic or caustic um, mm. community for, um, for I mean, we, we talk about women in, in general. You know, sometimes we, we deal with a lot of misogyny and sexual harassment. Um, but when you start looking at minorities specifically, there, there tends to be some issues there as well. So it's it's very very caustic. Worse um, than just cultural differences. No, I think I think I think it is cultural differences. But the problem is an expectation that we um, that we don't have those cultural differences. Right, the idea of being colorblind, for instance. Oh. Right, right. I don't see color. Can't you be you? You, you know, you're a humanist and and, and what have you. You know, I, why do you need the term black atheist? Can't you just be an atheist? It's like, well, mm -hmm. yeah, if the rest of the world, you know, operated that way, sure. But if, if not, you know, you're denying a lot of my reality. And, and unfortunately, people don't don't see that. Yeah. And, and like you've brought up numerous times within just the black community, you've got Afro-Caribbean and African-American. There's there's a wide variety of cultures represented <laughs> yeah. within that that subset. Yeah. Uh, now, like one thing I've seen in in Boise, we've had at, at various meetings I've gone to, maybe man, three or four black people show up ever. Yeah. But this is also an area where the vast majority of blacks are Somali refugees. Yeah. So the population, it'd be difficult to create that here. Uh, whereas, like, what we need here is a ex-Muslim group and a Hispanic group. Yep. And one one other area I do want to get into is why is why is okay, we've already covered part of why black atheists is a big deal, but what's the part about the the black community? Why is it that some people think that those are incongruent ideas? Uh boy, because culturally it's something that we don't talk about. It's been very, very taboo. Um, I like it. there are a lot of theories that um, that that suggest that it, it is it goes as far back as slavery. Right. I mean, um, there is the humility associated with uh, with traditional values. Right. There's always got to be something greater than you. Um, so there's always going to be this this God creator. I mean, how could there not be look at the world around you? It's there has to be grand design, um, and and I, I think part of it is is the the legacy of of slavery specifically, and we see a lot of that you know that that just hasn't gone away. Uh, again, it's a throwback to tradition where y you had Christianity beat into you, right? I mean, you, there, there were no choices, and so you gave that to everyone else, and and it became part of the racial identity, which is already somewhat fractured, uh, fractured in, um, uh, in America when you start looking at African Americans. Um, it, it is, you know, I, I want to say it was W.E.B. Du Bois who talked about the veil of double consciousness and, and how when you look at the black Negro conscious. It's, it's, it, it is very, very different because you have to see yourself through different different lenses. Um, and so when you're trying to cohere what that identity is, you can't, it, there can be a separation of church and state, but there can't be a separation of church and race. I mean, it, it it's part of, again, it's part of Black identity. Uh, culturally, there are certain things that are in the media that that keep this idea of, of what this identity is, you know, very strictly religious. When you take a look at cultural icons that continuously reaffirm their thanks to a God, whether it is uh, on stage or, or you know, at, 
after a ball game or whatever it is, um, you know, it, it's still throwing back to, mm-hmm. I have to thank, uh, you know, I, I have to thank a God or a master. Uh, it, it's also really disturbing to see so many, you know, it was after the, um, the massacre in Carolina where we saw the families talking about forgiving uh, people and, and they were relying on God to help with the healing, et cetera. Nowhere else would you see such a thing, right? It's it's just unheard of. And it it is because of the fractured identity of, of African Americans. I can say that because I study psychology a lot. So uh, <laughs> you, know, you you can send the hate mail to Alex at dog There you go. <laughs> wait, wait. Send all the hate mail to uh uh, Smalley at <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, he he. You know what? He he sends it to me anyway. So <laughs> whether it's aimed at me or not, I I get it all. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, you know, but but so many of the the great civil rights leaders were preachers. Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah. so of course, you know, let my let my people go. So you have no, you have Moses, 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 and Moses, and then there was the other Moses. And yeah. So when you start taking. <laughs> When you start taking a look at at the civil rights movement, um, it's Dr. Reverend, Reverend, Dr. Reverend, Dr. Reverend. Guy, um, <laughs> it's <laughs> it, it, so you have that, um, and you forget the other drivers in the uh, in the civil rights movement. Um, you, you you forget um, the you know the Langston Hughes. You forget. I mean, there, there are so many secular names. A. Philip Randolph. Um, People that made things happen and said, you know, are you done praying? Because we got work to do. That's what they were there for, right? Liberation during the civil rights movement would not have happened if it was nothing but preachers. But we don't talk about that. Yeah. Right? We don't talk about that because, you know, if it was up to Martin, if it was up to Martin, he'd still be praying, right? It was like, <laughs> no, you got, <laughs> you got to get up off the knees and we got, we got to march. The march wasn't his idea. Idea. We talk about Selma. That wasn't his idea, all right? When it came down to, and I'm not taking anything away from the man. I'm just saying there's there's a lot of credit to spread around, right? And 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 the and the one guy that we really tend to gloss over, who was not Christian, who had a significant impact on the idea of black liberation, um, and you see it today. You see it today with the Black Lives Matter people almost constantly. Is Malcolm? Yep. Yeah. Right. He uttered he uttered words that still reign true today and piss off a lot of people. But, you know, there, there's a reason why why the Black Lives Matter activists have no issues running up in front of someone and disturbing. Right. Uh, disturbing a political rally or whatever. And there's and there's no surprise that some of those folks, although I wish they would all come out already, are also secular. There's no surprise at all that they're secular. Right. Because they're not tied to this idea of authoritarian benevolence or 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 behavior or obedience associated with with authority. And and Malcolm uttered. Yeah, uttered one sentence that still drives a lot of them. And that's by any means necessary. And that is what drives them still today. Yeah. And how much of the. The church's hold over the black community is, is just tied to the standard, uh, or, or not necessarily standard, but the, the common socioeconomic disadvantages. A lot. Next question. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if we could fix all of the, the socioeconomic problems, do you think black atheists would be as common as white atheists? I don't know if it would be as common, but I, I would say that you would see, um, you would probably see a uh, more... You probably see a little bit more parody, but you know. But I was going to ask about parody myself. Uh, you, do you think you, if uh, atheist um, outreach programs could be more like churches in in the the things that they offer help and services that there would be less of a pool to to keep that community going? Man, did you read one of my speeches? This sounds like one of my talks, actually. <laughs> Yes, actually, I, I've, I've, I've spoken about that um, uh, in, in one of the plans, you know, uh, on, on how do you how do you um, change the face of humanism and and begin to reflect the diversity that is actually out there, especially when you look at those that are downtrodden or 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 suffering. 
um, and you have to go into places where you're uncomfortable going. And that's something that the secular community has not traditionally been able to do, right? Well, you know, you, you meet in areas and places that you're comfortable in and, and you do charity in places that you're comfortable in. And so you're never really bridging that. So when we start talking about out- outreach, um, you've got to get your hands really dirty and you've got to cross that, you have to cross the other side of the tracks and go talk to them. Now, if you're doing it correctly, um, you're not seen as you know, oh, look, there's another white savior. I, I've, I've, we already got those. Thank you very much. See you later. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're there in a, um, in not necessarily an advisory capacity, but just to help. Hey, here, I'm Alex. I'm, I'm here to help. What do you need? I got um, some hands. Can you use them? I, yeah, I got some hands. Can you use them? But you can't be the face of that, right? Mm-hmm. You cannot be the face of that because they, they won't trust you. I wouldn't trust you, right? Um, I, I, I know what you sold me before. I'm looking at the results of it, of it right? <laughs> it's all right. I wouldn't trust me either. <laughs> and, and so, so it's like, and if you if you show me a boat ticket, I'm running. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> I was gonna try and not use one, but yeah, why not? <laughs> 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 God damn it. But. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so you, you you gotta you gotta show up, but you gotta show up correctly. You've got you've got to be able to be silent. You've got to be able to stand behind someone and and you know and sometimes putting your ego completely aside. Um, you've got to be able to create a platform and then walk away. Um, and sometimes you have to be able to let organizations that you help build, um, fail because that process of failing sometimes inspires more. So there's a lot of discussion that, that should and could be had with workshops, with secular groups on how you do outreach properly and build the bridges between the minority community and and secular, because there's so much there that we could and should be doing. And if you are able to put the distance between them and the church or uh, close the gap between you and them, which is actually more crucial, then you'll see more people start coming in. Uh, but you've got to also be able to replace some of those services, which is really, really, really hard. And we, 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 work, we deal with different realities, right? Unemployment is what, less than 10% in the United States? Well, it's closer to 50% in the African-American community. So you have Holy all crap. these... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're dealing with really, really different numbers and very different realities. Um, and so you need someone that understands those differences when you're trying to really bridge that. Yeah. And that would, that would apply to other minority groups as well. I would not be able to reach, uh, the Hispanic community here in, in the treasure Valley. They, about half of them are migrant farm workers. Yeah. Yeah. A so lot it, of them so, don't speak English. <laughs> right. So, so here's, here's the numbers that you know, um, everyone was jumping up and down at the last Pew survey, right? And and I gave I gave it you know a slow clap while everyone else was you know popping popping crystal and everything. I'm like, yeah, I don't. <laughs> yeah, when you look at the numbers, it's about thirty percent of the general population shows that they are becoming more and more secular. If you take a look at the projections and start extrapolating out. Um, we think that over the next five, 10 years, that number could hit as close to 50%. I doubt it. But, um, you know, depending on the model that you look at and, and trust, so like, look, this is, this is good news. When you start digging into some of the demographics, you say, okay, look, look, look at what happened with women, right? Um, specifically. Um, and, and it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're pushing that 50% mark of those people that are secular say that they're women. That's great. Uh, when you take a look <clears throat> at the Latino community, uh, again, you're seeing 8% and upwards of 8% or more that identify as secular, so not necessarily religious. And so everyone's like, this is great. This is progress. There was no change in the African-American community. Mm. No change. Mm. Nothing. Nada. Zero. Wow. Zilch. Churches hold such a stranglehold on the community. 
Uh, again, it's also part of your cultural identity, yeah. right? And it, 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 it is absolutely a stranglehold. Yeah. And okay, with Hispanics, they've got something that, that blacks don't. There's been a huge shift over the last 20, 30, 40 years from Catholicism to charismatic. Yes. Especially yes. charismatic. Yes. Yes. That would weaken the religious hold right there. The whole thing about moving to a new area and you know, first thing somebody asks you is like, hey, what's your name? And second is, what church do you go to? Yeah. And third is, come to mine. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, but so so the, one of the things that that is kind of cool um, uh, that does give me uh, a little bit of a glimmer of hope is when talking about, you know, maybe we don't see a tremendous shift or growth to secular uh, to secularism in the African American community specifically per se, but we are seeing more visibility within the African American community. So you know, you are seeing um, atheist voices that are just getting louder. They've found their voices. They've found microphones, and it is becoming more commonplace to hear or talk about atheist, which was at one point completely taboo, um, but it's becoming less so. So I, you know, I, I don't want to paint too grim of a picture because I think that that's the beginning of change. And if we can get the rest of the numbers to shift um, and we can actually begin to address, you know, the inequality, um, the, uh, the wealth inequality, we can talk about the despair, we can talk about the unemployment, we can talk about the issues that keep the church so strong um, and thriving within the African American. If we can address those, we can begin to sever the um, the instinctual ties. The if maybe not the the ancestral ties. Maybe we can clip the cultural umbilical cord, and that would be a great win for us. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Wow. So, Alex, got anything to pimp? Like, what's some good projects? Something Man, that we can... What? Me. Me. I'll pit me <laughs> all day. No. Um, you. You can't even... <laughs> you have troubles reaching over the counter. What are you talking about? You. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, short person jokes. Yeah, we, we, we talked about height before we started the show. Since nobody else knows what that was just about. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just let it fly. Let it float. Let's just, just hang there like a bad turd. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can I pimp? Um, well, one is, man, I'm, I'm, I've got so many things going on. Um, one is, uh, if, if, if you ever need someone, if someone needs help, um, you can always reach out to assistance via Secular Avenue. That's a project that I'm working with Noel George and company. Um, Noel being the, um, uh, the new person in charge of the Foundation Beyond Belief. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for taking that job. She's, she's a wonderful person um, just all around, so I'm, I'm very glad to be working with her. And Secular Avenue is uh, is focused on uh, finding people a safe route to autonomy. So whether you're um, a teen or what have you who is in the LGBT community and you don't feel safe coming out, there are other, um, there are other charities out there that will help you, but we can help you as well. If you are in a domestic abuse or you know, potentially violent or controlling relationship and you're secular and you're trying to find your way out, we uh, help with that as well. Again, that's secularavenue.org. So that's the first project. Um, okay, if you're in that's Dallas, really cool. yeah, I, that, that, that right there is, is probably my favorite, um, my, my, my favorite project. Black nonbelievers uh, is, is something that I believe in. Uh, pretty heavily, uh, regardless of where you're at, there's probably a group that is forming, has formed, has announced, whatever. Uh, they do meetups, uh, I think, in, in uh, I think it's the first and third weekend, um, first and third Sundays of every month, you can usually find something going on with a Black non-believers group. So if you find your way to support that, um, BN Inc. is still fundraising. Um, you know, trying to get more supplies and stuff like that out there to many of their affiliates. So, so that's two. Um, and let's see, two other things that I'm working on. One is 
my blog specifically at Pathios, and that's uh, the graffiti wall. I'm always causing trouble there. So be prepared. <laughs> um, you know, seriously, be prepared to. Um, I don't want to say be offended, but you're probably going to be challenged. I, I I don't have any issues, you know, challenging conviction and 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 graven uh, graven images. So whatever you believe, you know, or you think you believe, be prepared to be be challenged a little bit. And people can usually find me weekly on Dogma Debate with David Smalley. Again, I'm the funny one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And links to all of those will be in the show notes. Cool. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this has been overdue and awesome. Oh, fucking hell. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me, finally. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, come on, you've never heard of us before. No, that's so not true. What, what was his name again? Yep, yep. <laughs> fucking knew it. Fucking knew it. <laughs> All righty. And uh, for our listeners, we will be back next week with the news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.